So hormones are a huge lever for bone health, but how do you know if they're optimized? Well, stick around because we're going to review what labs we check, what ranges we look for, and what to do if you can't get this kind of care. But here's a secret. It's not just about estradiol and testosterone levels. So we know that there's a lot of levers for bone health, and we focus on some of the big ones here in our practice, like exercise, nutrition, gut health. But hormone optimization has gotten so important for us that we actually created a separate company specific for that, for people that need access. And we hear this problem all the time. But even with that, we can't grow fast enough to meet the need and solve the problem that is not only a national problem in the US, but this is a worldwide issue. It's a worldwide issue for hormones. It's a worldwide issue for bone health. So my goal is then to educate people through this platform and any other platform that I can get on about what we've learned when it comes to optimizing bone health through the lens of hormone replacement so that you can take that to your own providers if that's possible for you. So in this video, we're gonna talk about hormone levels. We're gonna talk about a rarely discussed hormone called FSH. We're gonna talk about its role how to measure it, and how to wrap this all together. And don't worry, this won't take long. It's not going to be that complex. It's actually pretty simple. It's mostly a matter of whether or not you can find the care and then understanding what to do with the numbers. Okay, so let's start with the big gun, estradiol. Lots of conversations around estradiol, lots of conversations around the risk and the fear and absolutely all of that. But I'm not here to talk about that. I just want to talk about our experience using estradiol through the lens of health span and bone health. Most of you have told me that when you go to your doctor and you talk about this topic of improving bone health with estradiol, you get all kinds of responses. But some of them are, we don't use hormones for that, even though it's FDA approved for that, actually. Other responses are, you're too old, it's too dangerous, all the usual stuff. But one of the things that I hear frequently that is very pertinent to this discussion is that your doctors don't want to check your hormone levels because we don't need to check hormone levels. I'm quoting and for those of you that are listening to this and not watching. Um, so when doctors say they don't need to check hormone levels, they are right in that if you're using a low dose product, it doesn't really matter what the levels are because that's not why they're using it. They're not using it to optimize your levels. But from our perspective, I'm going to show you what the literature says. I'm going to show you our clinical perspective that we need to understand what the hormone levels are in order to make adjustments in dose and also talk about symptoms. But the biomarkers are absolutely necessary in this approach. Now, I'm not here to talk about all the things estradiol. I'm not here to talk about the risks and all those things. I have other videos on that topic. But what I want you to understand is that estradiol, while it's important, and it does have an impact on osteoclasts, slows down resorption, also has an impact on osteoblasts, helps to build bone. It has to be balanced with all the other hormones. It's not the only one that matters. So I'm not going to go into any more detail on estradiol. Let me just say that there is plenty of evidence to say that using especially topical estradiol at adequate doses will improve bone mineral density in most women. And there are studies that demonstrate up to 10% improvement in 12 months. So it is a powerful tool. All right, so let's move on to testosterone. So from a testosterone perspective, some doctors, especially doctors who like to use pellets, doctors who like to really use high levels of testosterone will say that if you use androgens like testosterone, then you are going to see improvement in muscle and bone. And that's true. The challenge is when it comes to research in testosterone, especially on women, we don't have great research to say what the right doses are the potential risks, mostly in the form of side effects, not really risks, uh, but in the form of side effects and especially at different ages. And this is where I see a challenge because our average patient age is probably somewhere around early 60s. So what I'm finding is that in our older patients, they don't tolerate adequate levels of testosterone to have the impact that we would hope to see on muscle and bone. So we really are pushed to use optimal levels of estradiol and progesterone. But what's happened in our practice is that what we're finding is that if you optimize estradiol and progesterone, you actually don't need testosterone anymore. So we're able to still optimize hormones, maybe use a little testosterone if we need to in those that actually need it, um, but we're not using it as much as we used to. In younger women, especially as you get into you know 40s and 30s, you really can drive up testosterone levels and get a good clinical outcome. But again, the research isn't strong on how much we need, what the right dose should be, et cetera. It's also true in men, by the way, even though there's more research. The research in women, unfortunately, is just focused around hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So it's focused around this idea that the only purpose for testosterone in women is to improve libido and sexual function. And that's just absolutely not true. It does do that. 
But there are so many other potential benefits for testosterone in women that are just not talked about in the conventional medical model. So yes, it is a potential tool. It is something that we will consider using. Um, we'll talk about levels uh, in testing here in a minute, uh, but this is not something that we're using as much as we used to. Because again, if you optimize estradiol first, and looking at some of these other biomarkers, you'll see that your patients probably don't need it. And a little note here about men. I write a lot of these to really focus on women because it's most of who is watching this channel. We, we see the statistics behind it. Um, but there are men that have osteoporosis. In fact, one out of four men will have a fragility fracture in their life. So we should be talking about men and we should talk about testosterone in men. Low testosterone in men is absolutely a risk factor for bone loss because in men, we need testosterone. We also need estradiol. We also have progesterone, just not as much. And so for men, if you have low testosterone, the only estradiol you have in your body comes from your testosterone. So if you have low testosterone, you are going to have low estrogen. And you can measure this. We see it just consistently. So men that have even moderate levels of total testosterone typically have subpar levels of estradiol, and they are at risk of losing bone. So this is important for men too. So now let's talk about this hormone called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. So when it comes to hormone optimization, we talk a lot about estradiol levels, but what really matters is what's happening at the cellular level. And this is actually pretty hard to understand because it's difficult to measure. In fact, I don't know that it's measurable, but if you look at other hormones like FSH, you can get a sense of what's happening because you start seeing engagement with a feedback loop that was naturally present prior to menopause. So if you go back to you know cycling women, FSH, LH, another hormone, estradiol, they all play this synergistic back and forth. And so if you think of what happens with estradiol through the menstrual cycle, it rises in the follicular phase, falls at ovulation, it sort of rises again later in the luteal phase, but progesterone is dominant. So FSH has a feedback loop with um, estradiol, meaning that as estradiol rises, FSH falls. So they are inversely related. So then if you consider that FSH being secreted by the anterior pituitary is going to go down when estradiol levels are perceived by the brain as being adequate or high, then you could argue that FSH is a better measure of what's happening with estradiol levels than is serum levels of estradiol. And we've seen this clinically. So if you look at the estradiol levels based off of any exogenous estrogen, you can see numbers all over the place with different doses. This is one of the reasons why doctors don't like to measure hormones sometimes because they, they are unpredictable and sometimes they do rise and fall quickly. But if you look at FSH, it's not going to rise and fall as quickly. In fact, it can take a couple of weeks to optimize FSH, even at the same level of estradiol. And so if we optimize estradiol, or at least we think we have it optimized based off of our blood levels, but then we see that FSH is still 100, which is high, then we know that at the cellular level, at the brain level, your brain's not seeing enough estradiol. So you probably need more. Now, I'm not saying just keep going up and in, into infinity, there's a balance here, but FSH can be a tool to help us to understand what's going on at the estrogen level and the receptor level, but actually there's more. So it's not just the feedback loop that's interesting here. FSH may actually be playing a bigger role in our bones. So I ran across this study that I thought was really interesting and it was small-ish. It was 600 plus postmenopausal women and they measured estradiol, FSH, and bone mineral density. So this is kind of cool. And what they noticed, and this makes sense, is that higher FSH is associated with lower bone mineral density. Totally makes sense, right? Higher FSH means likely lower estradiol. So at first glance, I thought the study was kind of silly. Like we, we already know that, but there's an interesting twist here. They did notice some numbers that you could actually hang your hat on though. They noticed that the highest tertile, so the top third of FSH had three times higher odds of having a low bone mineral density at the femoral neck. That is actually a big shift. So then again, I thought this was really just about estradiol. We're just looking at estradiol and measuring a different way, but that's not what these authors published. So actually what they said is that if you look at this in a low estrogen environment, meaning less than 20 picogram per ML, I'm going to come back to that versus a high estrogen environment, the, the effect of FSH was reduced, meaning that FSH being high or low in a low estrogen environment played a bigger role. Now, I think this is actually really important 
because they say in this paper that FSH explains 70% of the relationship between estradiol and femoral neck. FSH explains 70%, not the estradiol. And what they're getting at here is that in a low estrogen environment, FSH matters. Now, if you drive estradiol through the roof, then FSH doesn't matter as much because there's obviously adequate estradiol. But the number here is also important. So they said in a low estrogen environment, less than 20 picogram per ml. Now, what's interesting about that is that if you look at low dose patches for hormone replacement, if you look at a low dose patch or a gel, oftentimes we see women have estradiol levels under 20 picogram per ml. So then we really do need to be looking at FSH because it has a better relationship with bone mineral density than does estradiol, according to these authors. So FSH may act independently of estradiol, even though they are related reciprocally, uh, but estradiol and FSH probably should be measured and considered independently of one another. So then this might lead to some questions about FSH as a hormone. Does anybody actually give FSH? Well, no, because remember, it's the opposite. So we want the absence of FSH. So don't go looking for FSH as a hormone. I'm sure you could probably find it online. Um, but we don't need to do anything from the outside for FSH. We just need to look at our labs and make sure that we're optimized so that FSH is coming down. And I'll talk about some levels here in a second. There is some interesting evidence to say that biochemically FSH can actually impact both osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So again, it might be functioning independently from estradiol to have an impact on bone. So I'm going to talk about the different labs that we order. I'm going to talk about the different levels that we look at. But before I get there, if you are looking for more information about hormone optimization, you want to hear how we do it common myths, misconceptions around hormone replacement therapy, consider coming to our masterclass. Our hormone specific masterclass is a different one from our bone health masterclass. This is driven around the need for educating women that hormone replacement therapy is an option. There's different ways around it. There's, there's so much material that you're not being told at your traditional medical doctor's office. So check out our hormone masterclass. It's taught by my team and it's a great opportunity to learn more about hormones and figure out if you have some room for growth and development in your own hormone optimization program okay so let's talk about how we put this together now really you need the big picture so our panel has over 300 biomarkers and uh, it's great to have all that information but arguably it's expensive your doctor is gonna, not going to order all these things so let's just talk at the bare minimum of things that we need so we need estradiol we need FSH, we need CTX, we need P1 and P, we need total and free testosterone, progesterone, and a complete thyroid panel. If you have all of those things, you at least know what's happening with your hormones. You might not know as a doctor how to treat it, but you as a consumer can understand what's happening with your replacement or your hormone optimization. Now, some of you who are not familiar with the bone health space might be wondering about CTX and P1 and P. So let me talk about these markers. So CTX is C-telepeptide. C-telepeptide is a bone biomarker that looks at osteoclast function. So the cells that break down bone, how quickly are they working? CTX can measure that and it'll tell us what's happening in the blood. P1 and P is the bone building marker. So this is the osteoblast function. It's looking at um, uh, collagen uh, development. So P1 and P tells us then what's happening on the osteoblast side. So what's cool is at different levels of estrogen and FSH, you're going to see an impact on CTX and P1 and P. It helps us to optimize our levels overall. So then let's talk about the different labs with the different uh, outcome numbers that we're looking for for optimization. And let me just preface this too. This is going to be variable for everybody, but these are some general guidelines that we start with. So let's start with estradiol. There are studies that would show that at 60 to 80 picogram per ml, there is a, a shift in bone mineral density. And if women are below that, then bone mineral density starts to drop. If they're above that, then they tend to maintain or lose it more slowly, well, either, either way. And so this is the threshold that if you are arbitrarily picking a number, that's the number that probably should be somewhere around. But I'll tell you that clinically, we've found that some women will have estradiol levels over 100 and they still have other biomarkers that are out of whack. So I don't think we can just go off of the estradiol levels. Similarly, we've had women that have had very low estradiol levels and all the other biomarkers look great. So they don't necessarily need more estradiol. We don't need to push them to 80 just to push them to 80. We need to look at the big picture. So estradiol levels have become less important for me as we've taken a, a better understanding of what's happening with the other biomarkers, particularly bone. 
Now, the CTX, we're still learning kind of what these numbers mean. The literature is good to demonstrate that these are great to follow. The ratio matters. Um, <clears throat> but absolute number for CTX, we want to see start to come down for postmenopausal women. And our goal right now is under 300. Sometimes it's under 400. Depends on what the panel is. But generally, somewhere around 300 or less. We want our P1 and P to be 80 to 100 or more. And then you can do a ratio there, and that's the P1 and P over CTX adjusted for units. Um, that ratio we want to be 150 or higher. And so that the bone turnover goals there can help us to understand, is estradiol optimized? Is it impacting all of our estrogen receptors in our bone? Now, when it comes to progesterone, we want the progesterone to be between 3 and 5 nanogram per mo. This is not always easily measured in blood, but if you're taking oral micronized progesterone, you should be able to see this in blood, and you want to make sure that you have adequate progesterone to counterbalance your estradiol. Now, total testosterone and free testosterone are also a little tricky because if you're only measuring total, you don't have the big picture. Free testosterone is actually what matters. It's what your cells are seeing. So we have seen women that have total testosterone of 100 or 200 or more on replacement, especially pellets. But sometimes their free testosterone is still less than one, which is way too low. So our goal is to get free testosterone somewhere between two to three, maybe up to four. Total testosterone is actually kind of not important as long as you're not having side effects of it. testosterone being an androgen. Now, other androgens can be helpful too. So oftentimes, instead of optimizing testosterone out of the gate, we'll actually optimize DHEA or potentially even pregnenolone. If you optimize the precursors of testosterone, sometimes the body will pick it up and they'll do it itself because most testosterone in women is not made in the ovaries. So the adrenal function, the peripheral conversion, all of that still happens in postmenopausal women. It is possible for them to make pretty decent levels of testosterone. All right, so to wrap all this up, when we look at hormones, we want to look at, again, thyroid, which I didn't even dig into, but we want to make sure that it's optimized. We want to look at estradiol levels, but alone, they don't tell me as much as I once thought that they did. We want to know what's happening with FSH. It's an independent predictor of bone mineral density. So we want to make sure that FSH is suppressed down below 30 at a minimum. Some docs are saying less than 10. All right. So FSH needs to come down. We want to make sure we have adequate progesterone to balance our estradiol. If we're using testosterone, we want to focus on the free rather than the total. Hope that all makes sense. So then bringing this all together, if you are struggling to find a way to get all of this in one place, totally understand and you are totally not alone. So we have created this company, Pema Bioidentical. If you can't get access to HRT, um, there's a link for how to get started with Pema Bioidentical. It's a nationwide telehealth platform. I'm not here to sell it. I just want you to know that it exists. All right. So that's it. Diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but a decision to reverse it is the beginning. I'll see you in the next video.